Welcome everybody to the first series of the Modeling Collaboratory for Subduction, RCN, CIG, and CSDMS series on the role of computational geosciences in the predictive assessment of plate boundary systems and hazards. I'm Torsten Becker. I'm here to um, help moderate this week's uh, series. The idea is to bring together MCS, which is a part of the SC40 initiative, CIG and CSDMS and their respective community to discuss what kind of approaches we can use to build physical models that are useful to understand plate boundary systems in general and hazards specifically. Today's talk and this week's series is gonna focus around induced seismicity and high performance computing approaches on how to address the related issues. And I'm gonna be handing things over to my colleague, Thomas Goebel, who will be introducing this week's speakers. Okay, hello, also you're from uh, Memphis. I believe so my video has been uh, turned off. So if someone wants to turn off my vi video, that's fine. If not, okay, here is, thanks. All right, so here's, there yeah. we go. Hello. Thank you. Hello again from episode. It's my great pleasure to introduce the speakers for today, Kayla Kroll and Jim Dietrich. So uh, Kayla received her bachelor's degree in geological science from Cal Poly Pomona in 2008 and master's and PhD degrees in geophysics and seismology, both from uh, UC Riverside in 2012 and 2015. And she now works as a senior research scientist at Lawrence Livermore National Labs. So Kayla has received several honors and awards, including a best presentation award from SSA, as well as graduate fellowships and a Beale Award from UC Riverside. And her research interest includes induced seismicity and geomechanics, which covers the talk today, and also fault interactions and stress transfer, as well as numerical earthquake simulations. And so the uh, talk is jointly given by Jim Dietrich, so it's also my great pleasure to introduce Jim Dietrich. Uh, Jim received his PhD from Yale in 1968, after which he joined the Earthquake Seismology Group at the USGS in Menlo Park. And in 2005, Jim moved to Riverside when he became a distinguished professor at UCR. So he has received many awards, including the Walter Bucher Medal from the American Geophysical Union in 2000. He has been a member of the Academy of Sciences since 2003 and received Distinguished Service Awards from the Department of Interior and the U.S. Geological Survey. So Jim has really revolutionized the understanding of frictional processes and rocks, their description by constitutive relations and implications for earthquake nucleation and seismicity rate changes. And more recently, his research also includes numerical simulations of earthquake processes and fault interactions the origins of earthquake clustering and seismicity and stress changes in volcanoes. And now I'll hand it over. The title for today's talk is Induced Seismicity, a Multidisciplinary Issue Spanning the Energy Sector. And Kayla, I believe is gonna get us started. Thanks, Kayla. Oops. Okay, can we all see my screen well? Perfect. Great. Um, okay, so thank you uh, to Torsten and Gabriel for the introduction to be here and Thomas for the great introduction. Um, I would like to make one small comment. I'm not a senior scientist at Lawrence Livermore, just a regular staff scientist. Um, and also before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge um, the carbon storage office within the Department of Energy's fossil energy office, um, who's largely supported our effort at Lawrence Livermore through their National Risk Assessment Partnership. Um, really briefly, as for a layout of the workshop, um, we've designed the daily presentations to build off of one another. Um, so today, after a brief overview of the induced seismicity problem, Jim will walk us through the current earthquake approaches that are being used to model induced seismicity. Tomorrow, Josh will give an overview of the numerical modeling methods for geomechanics, and I will speak more about coupling those models to earthquake simulators. And finally, on Thursday, we'll wrap up with a look of the future of exascale modeling of induced seismicity. All right, so to kick things off, um, 
probably you're all familiar with this map. Um, so basically since 2008, we've observed um, a sudden increase in the rate of seismicity in regions um, in the central and eastern US and in Western Canada, and then also other regions in Europe and Asia as well, but those aren't shown here. What is shown here though is seismicity that's been linked to the oil and gas operations in at least eight states. Um, and that has produced maximum earthquake magnitudes above five in several cases. The most significant increase in seismicity um, was observed in Oklahoma, where the rate of magnitude three or larger earthquakes was at one point higher than that in California, which of course lies along the plate boundary. So that was rather unusual. Um, beginning in 2015, though, industrial operations began to decline. The state of Oklahoma enforced a limit on the scale of fluid disposal, and subsequently the seismicity rates began to drop. Um, but more recently, there's been an increase in the rate of um, induced seismicity, particularly in West Texas, including a magnitude 5 earthquake in March of last year. To date, um, the most prolific sources of induced seismicity has been um, two common practices related to the oil and gas industry. The first is unconventional um, production of uh, hydrocarbons using hydraulic fracturing methods, and the second is the disposal of wastewater. Um, in some cases, this wastewater is, uh, or this waste fluid includes the hydraulic fracturing fluids, um, but the most abundant source of this wastewater is formation brines that are co-produced with the fossil fuels. Um, similarly, large-scale subsurface storage of carbon dioxide has been identified as a leading technology to reduce the level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and thought of um, to be used to uh, combat global warming. And this activity also has the potential to induce seismicity. Um, that's because in all of the cases, seismicity is related to two primary mechanisms. The first is um, the direct pore fluid pressure effect where injected fluid comes into contact with earthquake faults on the subsurface. And the second mechanism is uh, the poroelastic stress changes that are caused by expansion or contraction of the rock volume due to injection and production of fluids. To date, the largest outbreak of induced seismicity, as I said, has been in Oklahoma. Um, their operators were injecting large volumes of fluid into the Arbuckle group, which has been identified as one of the largest subsurface storage reservoirs in the US. Um, as of 2018, it's estimated that about 5% of the Arbuckle storage capacity had been used, yet there was a nearly exponential increase in the seismicity there. Um, the current plan for carbon storage is to also use these deep saline reservoirs to store CO2, uh, like the Arbuckle. So in this map, all of the blue regions are have been identified as high um, storage or high capacity reservoirs with their capacity listed below. Um, okay, so let's now take a brief look at the potential storage volumes that would be required for carbon storage to have a global impact on climate. So first, if we assume that a single power plant generates about three megatons of CO2 per year, and let's assume that we need to store that CO2 for, say, a thousand power plants, then we'd have to store about 3,000 megatons of CO2 per year to have a global impact on climate. And for comparison, this volume is about 30 times larger than the disposal volume um, that's currently stored in the Arbuckle, where they were storing about 100 megatons equivalent uh, per year, and that did lead to a significant increase in seismicity. So because of that, it's really important to understand the impacts of basin scale storage and also to develop mitigation strategies to reduce the potential uh, for inducing seismicity. So um, just to look at Oklahoma a little bit further, um, here the seismicity rate was closely tied to the injection rates, which were in turn uh, directly related to the price of oil. So what we see here in this somewhat outdated figure um, is that when the oil prices are high, as shown in purple, the production um, from the region is, is profitable despite the fact that you're, they're producing about 10 barrels of water for every barrel of oil. And the high water cut uh, drove operators to dispose of fluids in the Arbuckle, which is shown in the red line. And after about a year or so of this disposal, we see the uptake, or the uptake in seismicity, uh, which is shown in the black line. And the seismicity occurred over a region that was more than 150 miles wide. And then as I mentioned before, starting in 2015, the state be uh, began imposing regulations on injection volumes, but also oil prices began to drop. And with this led to less oil production and then less fluid disposal, and then subsequently the seismicity rates began to drop as well. Um, even still though, some studies suggest there was at least a 50% chance of having a moderately sized, say magnitude four event uh, through the year 2025. And what's not shown on this plot 
um, is that the oil market really tanked at the beginning of 2020 and so operators basically moved out of this region entirely. Um, but not to worry because uh, there has been an, up, an uptick in seismicity in Texas. Um, and so they seem to be taking over where Oklahoma left off. Um, in Texas, the Bureau of Economic, Economic Geology estimates that there's the potential for more than 1 million um, unconventional production wells where the water cut is between 30 and 90%. So it's pretty high as well. So that means that there'll be a lot of wastewater that needs to be disposed of in Texas also. As of 2018, this map shows that the seismicity rates were already beginning to increase in regions uh, around the state, including the Dallas-Fort Worth area in blue, the Eagle Ford area in green, and then in West Texas in the Permian Basin in orange. And if we take a closer look at the, uh, the Delaware Basin in West Texas, we can see all the seismicity shown in black from this recent paper by Skomal et al., um, including this magnitude five earthquake that occurred early last year. And that brings me um, to the different types of modeling approaches that are currently being employed to study induced seismicity. In general, these methods fall into two categories. The first is the application of the earthquake rate equa uh, equations from Dietrich 94 um, to stress changes caused by injection. And so this figure from Skomal et al shows the application of such a method to seismicity that occurred near that magnitude five event um, where the seismicity rate model is in black, is fit to the observed seismicity in red, and then the seismicity rates are forecasted forward in time after the magnitude five. Methods like this can also be applied to generate spatial forecasts of seismicity rates as well as demonstrated by Norbeck and Rubenstein. Um, and also I should just mention that there's a number of groups that have either are currently working or have worked uh, with similar methods and Jim will be talking about those methods in detail uh, next. And then the second class of um, modeling methods involves the use of high fidelity full physics numerical simulators that couple geomechanical analyses with earthquake simulations. And these types of models are generally built upon geophysical data, lab testing data, petrophysical logs, um, and all that information is used to construct a static or dynamic model um, or geomechanical model and then used to simulate the pressures and the stresses that arise from fluid flow in the subsurface. Results of these geomechanical models are then transferred to earthquake simulators where we solve equations relevant to the earthquake cycle. Um, these figures are from one type of earthquake simulator that we use in our work called RSQSIM, um, which Jim will also talk about next, but also there are a number of groups working on similar methods. So with that, I'll say thanks for now and I'll turn things over to Jim. Jim, it looks like you're muted. Can you try again, please, Jim? I think you're still muted. Could you try hitting the unmute? There button? we are. Okay, I'm sorry. I had I hit the wrong button. Okay, I think I think uh, you can hear me now. Is that correct? Yes. Loud okay. Loud. Good. So thank you, Kayla. Um, I'll get started here. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, some non-high performance computing uh, that uh, I've done, but then I'll also explain a couple of the uh, simulation methods that. Um, Kayla mentioned. Um, so in, in the examples I'm going to show, we're looking only at the pressure diffusion effects uh, and not the portal elasticity. And so uh, it's typically represented as the um, uh, effective normal stress. And I'll mention kind of the two earthquake simulators, uh, RSU-SIM and in the earthquake rate formulation. And I'll kind of show some uh, general effects and then uh, look at a uh, study I've been involved with for a few years now of induced seismicity at the Valdagri oil field in uh, Italy. So um, I need to talk a little bit about rate state friction. I'm sorry uh, if you uh, some of you have heard this many times before, but the models are based on rate and state dependent friction. It's a laboratory based uh, friction uh, representation in which the coefficient of friction is 
Uh, principally, uh, this constant here, mu sub zero, which is kind of the nominal coefficient of friction, plus these perturbation terms proportional to the slip rate and the state variable. Uh, invariably, people ask, what is the state variable? Well, it seems to be a measure of the contact age, and it, it's apparently due to indentation creep. This is a microphotograph, a composite showing contact areas uh, at the, uh, for one second time interval, 100 second time interval, and 10,000th time interval. You can see that the contacts, they're creeping, they increase in area, and that appears to be the, uh, the uh, strength, uh, the, the origin of the state effect. Uh, I'll mention that with rate state friction, um, and this is an important point, unstable slip does not initiate at a specific threshold stress. Earthquake nucleation occurs over a range of stresses uh, above uh, the steady state sliding friction. And uh, this uh, representation of the, um, this parameter uh, omega, which is inversely proportional to slip speed, uh, this gives a, a quite a good representation of the time dependent and stress dependent nucleation um, effects. I won't go through the solutions, but we do have um, uh, analytic uh, approximations that work quite well. So a little bit now about RSQ sim. Um, so this was a simulator that um, uh, we've been involved in uh, developing for quite a few years. Uh, I need to mention uh, Keith Richards Dinger who really did the implementation. Um, I, I, I'll take credit for kind of having the uh, idea behind it and the general algorithm, but Keith has really made it work and I owe a lot of uh, thanks to him. Um, it implements the rate and state dependent friction ef effects, which leads to earthquake clustering. So the model represents foreshocks and aftershocks, uh, and they have the right properties, uh, Omori's law. Um, we're able to do very long simulations, up to a, a million earthquakes are pretty standard now uh, with, with this method. Um, and being able to generate that many earthquakes, we're able to do um, you know, fairly detailed statistical characterizations of uh, the model. Uh, and um, we're able to kind of explore parameter space at a fairly uh, good level. Now, the whole goal of RSQ sim was to simulate earthquakes in fault systems. Here's, here's a nearly current model of California up here in the corner, whoops, sorry, uh, up here in the corner showing the faults and their uh, slip speeds that are uh, represented. Um, We've done simulations with up to a million fault elements, and that's very definitely a high performance computing range to do that. And with the high resolution uh, that we're able to attain, we can look at a range of earthquake magnitudes. And also we can kind of study interactions among earthquakes, continuous creep, slow slip events, uh, and after slip with this model. Now the computational scheme uh, is quite unorthodox. Uh, if we could, We'd love to do this with finite elements, but this is far beyond the, the kind of simulations we're doing are currently far beyond the reach of finite elements. So the computational scheme is we look at changes in fault sliding state. And um, we had the model has three basic sliding states when it's simulating earthquakes. Uh, the first is the fault is locked and uh, we use rate state friction and the faults uh, strength ages by log of contact time. Uh, the next state is nucleating slip. And here we have the analytic solutions that we incorporate into the simulator with rate state friction. And then, uh, so we go through the sequence and then finally uh, this leads to earthquake slip. And we use a quasi dynamic uh, method here to simulate the uh, earthquake rupture propagation. We use the shear impedance relationship here to uh, represent the earthquake slip speed. And so this is really a kind of a zeroth order uh, dynamics. Uh, and, but it works quite well, I think, because slip speed controls the rate of stress transfer to the rupture front. And so we're able to do pretty good representation of ruptures, I believe, with this. And um, 
the uh, also kind of rep we can represent uh, uh, earthquakes, slow slip events, creep, and and so on. Now, um, the reason this works is that it's a very efficient computational scheme. Um, the computations scale roughly by the number of elements to the first power. Now, I should mention it's a boundary element method. So we just have homogeneous elastic half space that we're doing this with. Um, typical dynamic finite element codes scale by n to the third or n to the fourth. So when you get the big models, um, uh, RSQ sim really starts to uh, show, uh, shine uh, it's, it's because of its efficiency. So this is a very simple model uh, here just to kind of demonstrate what a rupture looks like for this. This is a simple strike slip model and it has kind of these phony looking patches with high normal stress on it. it if you like, you can call these asperities, I guess. And so here's, uh, this is an old slide, but it's, I think it's still valid. Uh, this is a fully dynamic finite element simulation uh, showing rupture front contours and a sweeping uh, with forced nucleation in this case at the end, because you had to do that with the dynamic model, or the finite element model. So you can see that the rupture wraps around these, these uh, strong points. And uh, that's the finite element um, model. And here is the RSQ sim simulation of it. You can see some differences, but overall, um, I have to say I was surprised at what a good job it can do. Um, and the computation time here, uh, when we did this finite element simulation, I think it took uh, several hours to do just this one rupture propagation on this really relatively small fault. This just took a few minutes, maybe and now with kind of current laptop computers, you can, you can do this kind of simulation in, in probably less than a minute uh, on the computer. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of flavor of what uh, the simulations look like uh, with rupture propagation, this is a very high resolution with a lot of elements uh, for a relatively small fault that Keith put together. And uh, we've, uh, he forced nucleation to occur here. There's two faults with an offset. And what you'll see is the rupture will propagate bilaterally and then it will jump to the second fault. So we have rupture jumping in that model. And then it propagates uh, on both these faults. And uh, the red areas are actively slipping areas. And you see a little bit of blue here at the edge of the rupture front. That's the nucleation where the rupture is nucleating at the rupture front uh, based on those equations. So I'll give give this a start and just watch it. Oh, there it goes. Rupture propagates a very uniform bilateral. There it jumps. And so it's jumped to the fault behind. And um, if you've watched the finite element simulations of rupture propagations, you see something very similar to this. So there's no, there's no wave propagation in this model. So everything is happening uh, just at the rupture front and the stresses are being passed uh, quasi-statically, but immediately. Now here's another simulation that Keith put together. This is a very early version model of the California uh, fault system. Uh, the is color coded here using a um, uh, the um, predicted uh, uh, ground motion. Uh, I believe it's uh, no uh, acceleration, uh, and uh, so uh, this this particular movie uh, I won't show it all because it runs for about an hour, has about a million earthquakes in it. So I picked out just a little piece of it just to give you an idea. So it starts here. There's been a 1906 type earthquake that occurred starting here, just about where I live right now, right there. And um, uh, we'll just go ahead and watch it. But you'll see clustering effects. You'll see earthquakes will cluster around one area then move to another. And this involves some foreshocks and a lot of aftershocks kind of uh, at the resolution of doing. So we'll just, I'll just turn it on and watch it go. Well, that was a Parkfield earthquake that just went off. Another, see earthquakes jumping around. I think that was a Hayward Fault earthquake that occurred in the Bay Area. And it ends with seven hours of terror. So those three big earthquakes occurred uh, within seven hours of one another. 
I'll, I'll point out that this was a, like a million event simulation, and that was the only triplet that we've seen there. But it's uh, it does show that uh, you know, ruptures do cluster up, and which they do in nature. And uh, uh, so hopefully that gives you. So go on to the next one now. So I'll talk about the second earthquake. Uh, simulations that we've been using. <clears throat> it's based on the earthquake rate formulation, which uh, is analytic. And uh, this was published in 1994. This, this is what the formulation looked like. Um, the idea behind this is, is that earthquake, uh, we assume that earthquake nucleation controls both the time and place of earthquakes, but not necessarily their size. And uh, so that any processes that alter nucleation times then will control changes in seismicity rates and, and locations. And uh, so I've implemented this model uh, on a single fault that consists of uh, typically a thousand to two or 3000 fault elements. And we compute the uh, earthquake rates at each element and um, a weakness of this method is that there's no interaction among the elements. We only compute rates and, uh, and, and those rates are computed only from external forcing by tectonic stressing and evolving uh, fluid pressures. So earthquake rate here is a function of this state variable gamma, which has this evolution uh, law. And uh, sigma E is the effective normal stress here, which is influenced by fluid pressures, it changes with fluid pressures. And um, we uh, just turn the model loose and let it go. Now, uh, a characteristic, uh, an important characteristic of the evolution equation uh, here is that at steady state, the gamma evolves to one over the stressing rate. And that means that, so the steady state seismicity is just a simple linear function of stressing rate. And this is, this is what you would expect, um, this linear dependence, be, since earthquakes relieve stresses at a rate that's proportional to R. And um, for earthquakes to continue at a steady state, then the stresses have to be renewed continuously to keep the uh, process going. And uh, th uh, this, th uh, this term R over tau dot R, this is just a scaling term. So that's a steady state rate uh, at some uh, reference rate, tau sub R. And, uh, but because, because of this linkage between stress release and stress renewal, we can solve for this ratio, uh, and I'm calling it F here in the following, uh, from the frequency magnitude distribution, uh, particularly the, the Gutenberg, so-called Gutenberg-Richter B value and uh, the minimum observed magnitude. Uh, and additionally, the uh, earthquake stress drop. And so over here on the right, um, I show a plot of log um, stressing rate in megapascals per year versus log earthquake rate for different magnitude, minimum magnitude, uh, thresholds. And uh, so you can see, uh, and, and I kind of informally labeled these stable, slow tectonic, moderate tectonic, and fast tectonic. Um, I think probably this audience is mostly interested in the moderate and fast tectonic uh, end of the spectrum uh, for plate boundaries. Uh, but many of the examples we have of induced seismicity occur in kind of at these slower rates. And uh, I'll just point out that uh, if we start a simulation at the background seismicity rate, then we have to have quite a large change in fluid pressure to bring the observed earthquakes up to a level that we can detect. And so I've kind of just put an estimate of a detection level for uh, earthquakes of these magnitudes uh, and this detection level is one earthquake per square kilometer, or sorry, 0.1 earthquake per square kilometer of fault surface. Uh, and that's, that's more or less, you know, that, that detection level will change, of course, on a lot of things. But I picked that particular number because 
most induced seismicity episodes are of short duration and occur on a relatively restricted section of fault. If you're looking at a whole wide, uh, wide region uh, and you have a lot of time to observe, you, this, this detection level will, of course, increase. Just to give you a little flavor of kind of what the rate model does. Um, so that I have uh, these panels here. The upper row is stress as a function of time. And the lower row is the resulting earthquake as a function of time. If we have a stress step, uh, then we get a exponential jump in seismicity rates. And then a one over T, a Mori type aftershock decay back to a residual level. And the, there's a characteristic time that's uh, inversely proportional to the stressing rate for that decay. Uh, if you have a stress drop, then seismicity drops. It, it never drops to zero unless the, the shear stress drops to zero and, and the equations go singular at that point. But the restoration time to get back to a steady state seismicity level then is proportional to the uh, stress drop. And finally, over here, I just show what happens if you change the stressing rate. It takes some time to reach a new steady state level. Okay, just uh, finally, uh, I think we're gonna hear a lot more about uh, uh, fluid pressure and pressure diffusions. Uh, for some of the simulations I'll show momentarily, um, we've used just this very simple analytic model of Wang and, and uh, um, turned that into a Green's function for uh, fluid pressure diffusion as a function of the um, uh, pressure diffusion coefficient here, uh, porosity and compressibility, and V dot is the injection rate. So this term is just a scaling term on the amplitude of the pressure changes, and this uh, complementary air function term uh, gives the uh, decay with time You'll note that as time goes to infinity, this term goes to one. And so the pressure uh, increases rapidly at first and then tails off asymptotically to a constant value. Since seismicity rates are proportional to uh, stressing rates, and this is, so this, this, this is a measure of the effective stressing rate. Uh, and over here is the pressurization rates. Um, we expect in general for an unconfined reservoir that induced seismicity will eventually slow and uh, stabilize and, and go to zero. So this is pressurization rates. Little red circles are where the pressurization rate is the maximum. So up to this point, the earthquake rates will be increasing. And then following this point, they'll at this distance, they'll start to decay and go asymptotically to zero. So here's, here's a real simple example with a little fault. Uh, it's an older example um, where just injection at a constant rate. So this is the total number of earthquakes per year on this little fault surface. Uh, and you see that the earthquake rates uh, immediately rise and then they begin this, this uh, uh, long decay. Uh, these contours here, red is pressure and black is earthquake rate. And even with a simple model, we can see some pretty complicated effects. So here, here we have a series of, uh, we, we use some pressure jumps, I'm sorry, some injection, injection rate jumps, which result in a pressure jumps, and at least a very complicated behavior. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Now, one of the things that's of interest in the induced seismicity community is the expansion of seismicity with time. It has the characteristic signature and Kayla showed a couple of examples of that uh, in her, in her uh, presentation. Um, and I just kind of want to show two contrasting ways of kind of displaying this. This is with uh, the pressure contours and the integrated rate over the fault surface uh, as a function of time. The dotted curve here, in both cases, this is the first arrival of the pressure front. Uh, and this dashed curve is the pressure needed to reach that uh, detection rate that I pointed out uh, earlier. Um, I find, uh, well, these contour plots are nice uh, quantitatively because you can get the exact number at an exact time, but uh, they don't really kind of show what's going on. So on the right-hand side here, 
I've shown earthquake events that are just drawn randomly at the integrated seismicity rates, just to show what the data, if you're looking at real data, what it would look like. Uh, the time span here is 10 years. And uh, so uh, I'll show a couple more plots here. Oh, okay, this, this is um, another item that's of great interest to uh, with induced seismicity is if it looks like it's getting out of control and you wanna stop it, uh, what does the seismicity look like uh, after you shut in the injection well? And uh, basically what this just shows is just these simple simulations is that the longer you inject, the longer the seismicity continues after you stop. And, um, and we can kind of quantify that for different uh, diffusion rates uh, um, and so on. So here's another uh, uh, example uh, for shut-in. And I'm showing this uh, for a specific reason. And that is, is that, uh, so, so here's, here's injection starts. This is the pressure front arrival. And then this lighter green curve is the, where the peak um, uh, pressure rates are reached. And then after that, the pressurization rates decline. Now with simple um, failure models, such as they say the Coulomb failure model, seismicity was shut off instantaneously at this point. But because of the time dependent nucleation, we get quite a few events that occur as the stresses are dropping on the fault. And uh, in this case, there are 178 uh, events. Uh, and I think the magnitude threshold in this simulation was 1.5. So there's a real finite probability of uh, earthquakes, even as the stresses are dropping. Okay, so I'd like to return a little bit to this, to this plot, uh, if I may. Um, so this is the steady state rate for uh, the B value of one, minimum magnitude of 1.5, and the stress drop was four MPA, incidentally, I didn't show that. And uh, I'll show simulations, uh, I, I better add this first. So now I've modified this detection rate. So, so this, is the, this is the detection, the minimum detection rate for actually recording a few earthquakes on the fault surface. Uh, just at that magnitude level. Then I've added this slope here to try to differentiate. Um, this, is, this is my estimate of a level at which you could discern induced seismicity and separate it from background tectonic seismicity. You'll note that at this steady state rate, at these more rapid plate boundary areas, the, you have, uh, you, you have high background seismicity that's higher than what you would even get with induced, uh, begin to detect induced seismicity here. So I'll show a sh series of plots here. First one is in a stable area. So there's a fairly high fluid pressure that has to be um, reached before you can start detecting earthquakes. And this is the estimate of the fluid pressure needed to, to reach this level. And so here, here again is the arrival of the pressure pulse, but it takes quite a long time after the very first uh, arrival of the pressure pulse from the um, injection to actually start producing earthquakes that you can see. And uh, so down here, uh, this is now in a slow tectonic, uh, what I call slow tectonic regime. Um, I'll show some simulations in Italy, and this is pretty much characteristic of the strain rates uh, the stressing rates in Italy. See, this is moved up. We're getting some background seismicity showing up now. This is just tectonic earthquakes. The expected number of tectonic earthquakes is 10. So most of these earthquakes we see up here, see some that are before the pressure pulse are due just to tectonic stressing. And over here is a, just a fault map showing the randomly drawn events. The white circle here is the pressure, is this final pressure change here. And then finally, for tectonic earthquakes, you get a lot of background seismicity. Expected number is over a thousand. Uh, so these are, these are mostly tectonic earthquakes. And here's the induced seismicity. It's a pretty vague boundary. It looks like there's some induced seismicity, little denser values here than out here. And again, the background seismicity right there. Okay, I'll move on now to uh, a case study 
This is the uh, Valdagri oil field in Italy. It's the largest on land oil field in Europe. So it's a very important oil field. And uh, they observed er induced earthquakes up here next to a, a wastewater injection well. This is produced water that, that uh, they wanted to get rid of. The average injection rate is about 2000 uh, cubic meters per day. That's, that's about 10 to the minus three or 10 to the minus four of the injection rates that Kayla mentioned would be needed for carbon sequestration. So this is really a, a very a very minor uh, amount of, of fluid that's being injected. Um, I need to acknowledge ENI, that's the uh, Italian uh, oil company that operates this field. Uh, they've been incredibly cooperative and helped support this study. And they uh, brought in an outside team to look at the induced earthquakes they were producing. This is the team. Uh, and uh, I very much, the, the, the um, simulations I'll show you are based on work that all these folks did to supply, and these folks to, um, to supply the uh, necessary inputs that were needed here. So the Valdagri oil field is down here in the foot, uh, the boot of uh, Italy. Uh, we have information as what the regional stressing rates are in that area. Uh, here's the induced seismicity. Um, the injection, the bottom of the injection well is about a kilometer away from this little fault. It's a very minor fault. Uh, but earthquakes were detected in less than a day after they started injecting fluids. And uh, so earthquakes really just shot up here. And this is the earthquake uh, as a function of time uh, for the field. Uh, and so we, uh, Keith, uh, Richard Dinger and myself uh, did two things. Uh, first of all, we did a study of the uh, faults and the seismicity those faults would produce under normal circumstances due to just tectonic stressing uh, in the region. And I'll show you some results of, from that. And this is the fault mesh uh, that was uh, generated from a fault model that uh, um, Shaw generated. And this is the Costa Molina fault that produced all of the in, induced earthquakes. So it's very minor. Now we wanted to look at the background seismicity because uh, we wanted to get an idea of kind of what the overall hazard is to be able to compare to what the current hazard might be and how it's changed from the injection operation. So here, here are a few events. Uh, I'll, first, first of all, uh, we ran the simulation for a million years to generate uh, good statistics to kind of sample all the possible states that might be reached in this under normal circumstances. Um, and uh, so a million years and overall simulation had two and a half million earthquakes. So this, these are some examples of ruptures uh, in the system here on the eastern boundary fault of this Graben structure. And we also see typically with our stu sims sometimes very complex rupture. Here's a rupture that involved four different faults. Uh, and uh, so I better go over this pretty quickly, but we generated this catalog to try to get some estimates of um, earthquake hazard, which I think is probably of interest to some of the people that are uh, sitting in today. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about, th there's kind of three different models. We can kind of do the standard Poisson probability estimate where lambda is the long-term earthquake rate, just the total number of earthquakes above some magnitude. And this probability is for one or more earthquakes in some time interval delta T. Now with this big catalog, uh, we can just sample some inter uh, randomly sample delta T intervals and see how many earthquakes we get in it. Uh, and uh, so we can get a probability that way. And, uh, and then finally, uh, there was a big earthquake uh, in 1857, the Basilicata earthquake. Uh, it killed 10,000 people when it happened. It was a major earthquake uh, at its time. And we think we see events like that in our catalog. And so, we, so we've done some conditional probabilities based on uh, what happens following that 
that earthquake. So here's here's a uh, the possible source fault for this big earthquake. Again, huge number of fatalities, and it's a complete rupture of this fault. This fault may be actually segmented. We're going to be looking at uh, alternative um, representations of it. And uh, so here's the here's the five year probability using these different methods the events magnitude 4.5 or larger. Interestingly, the Poisson is larger than the time independent. I think going into this, we thought these would be the same, but the Poisson, what it does is it spreads the after, there, there, could, there could be huge numbers of aftershocks uh, following the larger events. And what it does is take, when you do a Poisson probability in an unclustered catalog, it spreads those earthquakes over the entire system. And this difference, disappears pretty much when you go to the larger earthquakes since most uh, it's dominated by the small aftershocks. Uh, here's the time independent, time independent uh, probabilities and here's the uh, conditional probabilities. So we think we, well, the model shows a very significant stress shadow effect. This is roughly where we're at now. Uh, and uh, but uh, in, we, we, we think it's valid, but we're not sure. Okay, so now a little bit about the uh, rate model of the um, uh, for this injection here. This is the rate model uh, representation of the fault uh, that we used, and uh, this shows a second fault. Uh, the reason that's there is that we think that that is providing a very high uh, pressure. Uh, per permeability and pressure diffusion rate in transferring fluids from the injection well onto the fault. Since it was less than one day for an effect to be seen on this fault uh, once they started fluid injection. And that's, that's a pretty large distance. So we uh, modeled that. Now we've used the, instead of that simple pressure model, we've used the ENI pressure diffusion model. So this is a very large scale uh, simulation of fluid pressures and uh, fluid, diffu uh, fluid diffusion uh, in the model. We've used their model as an input. And this is the pressure change we get over um, this period, 11, uh, 11 years. The pressure change here. And here's this fault, which we think is conducting fluid and uh, which, they, which their model shows is conducting fluid onto the fault. And here's our best fit of the cumulative seismicity using the rate model to the observed seismicity. There are three different models here. And I don't know if you can see the three different curves. They use different, uh, so we have some pre parameters in the model. Two most significant ones are the coefficient of friction. Now that's mu sub zero in the rate state law and the rate state parameter A. These are all pretty reasonable values and they give um, pretty good looking results. And uh, here's, here's a map. So this is a map of our simulated earthquakes using uh, that rate model for period 2006 to 2010 with the earthquake, observed earthquakes over lane. And earthquakes for the lat latter period. Uh, and what we see is that the, the earthquakes spread out with time. We have fewer in the center here. Uh, the fluid diffusions uh, parameter is very high here. So the earthquakes, the stabilization as the pressures uh, tend to a constant level uh, happens very fast on this fault. So we see very fewer earthquakes toward the center and more toward the rim in this later stage. Also notice that the density of earthquakes changes drastically between these, between these two here. And uh, finally, this is just uh, a log of the earthquake rates versus time and the map of the fluid pressures that were computed here. So the pink shows uh, intervals where the fluid pressure is increasing to a peak. And I've terminated here kind of shortly after the peak. So we see overall fluid pressures are positive everywhere on the fault as we're having increasing seismicity. Here we have in, in the gray is show areas where overall this seismicity rates are decreasing and the fluid pressures for that period show that the fluid pressures are actually decreasing. The injection rates are, have, uh, 
are lower during this period. And there's also the stabilization effect. And earthquakes move pretty much to deeper locations. Here's another period where they increase the rate of seismicity. Uh, and again, uh, the fluid pressures are high everywhere on the fault. And finally, this long period of decreasing seismicity rates and the fluid pressures overall are negative. The pressurization rates are negative during this period. And so these, these, uh, these earthquakes are a lot of this continuing effect due to rate state uh, friction. And I'll stop there just to kind of, uh, kind of some major points. Uh, we think the simulations are in pretty good agreement with the observed seismicity. We use total fluid pressures and stresses and um, our free parameters that we have in the simulation, uh, coefficient of friction, density, and rate parameter A, they're not crazy. In fact, they fall right within kind of what you expect from laboratory uh, behavior. Fluctuating injection rates lead to very complex space-time patterns of seismicity. And seismicity continues during intervals where the fluid pressures are dropping. And so uh, I'll just point out that if you use a simple uh, Coulomb type stress model, those effects would not be represented at all because with Coulomb stress at a single failure threshold um, would shut down immediately once the stresses start to drop. So I'll stop there and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim, for, for a great presentation. And thank you also, Kayla, for the fantastic introduction. What I, what I failed to mention is that uh, we, of course, hope that the, uh, the three uh, webinars of the series hang together. And today was our introductory before moving on to the higher performance aspects. So we have a, have a number of questions uh, from, from the audience. And I'll, I'll hand it over to, to Thomas to, to handle them. Yeah, sure. So we have a question here. Um, let me start with Bill um, Harbert. Um, so this is a question about the Costa Molina uh, study. Was I guess the question is basically, was there any um, surface deformation measured from INSA or from tilt meters for the Italy study? Yeah, uh, I believe there, uh, there was some measurements. They're, they're not within the field itself. They tend to be outside the field. And um, the uh, ENI, the oil company, uh, it's my understanding is that they're going, they're interested in putting a number of uh, GPS stations within the field to monitor the uh, fluid pressure or to, 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 to monitor surface deformation. And those will help with kind of poor elastic effects in being able to look at ground level changes due to poor elasticity due to oil production which overall there's a net production of fluids from the field and the local, or perhaps the local, um, uh, the local injection and the uh, expansion you would expect from that from poor elasticity. Okay, so, thanks so much. Along the lines of, of the poor elasticity and linking things with surface deformation, I, you, you know, you had used these diffusive type um, pressure pulses. And I, I wonder what our understanding is in terms of linking the permeabilities and other material parameters that go into these um, to the observations from seismicity and to the rock mechanics constraints, which we might have for certain regions. Is there, I guess, mainly they will be driven by the, by the seismicity, but what is our understanding as to permeabilities and actual links to rock properties in general and for the regions specifically? Um, I could try to answer or at least address that. I, I, I can't really answer the question. I, I think you're going to hear more about it tomorrow um, where we have uh, Josh knows a heck of a lot more about this than I do. And, uh, but that it, uh, I'll just say that that's really uh, a topic of great interest to us and being able to link poor elasticity, pressure diffusion, earthquake stress changes, and, uh, you know, and uh, link all of those together. And uh, uh, so it's, it's a very relevant topic. <laughs> 
to, to be revisited tomorrow then and later. Great. Um, we will cover it in gruesome detail tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe a, a, a some related question to uh, Kayla. Um, so at the end, you, you mentioned that you're looking into um, reservoirs, reservoir simulators and coupling that into earthquake processes. Do you have a sense for how far out you can um, determine, you know, the required rock properties, you know, uh, frictional properties, et cetera? Um, so uh, to what distances are these, you know, reservoir uh, simulators um, feasible? Because some of the induced events are pretty far away. Can, can you include that in these... Um, Reservoir simulators? So the short answer is yes. Um, the more complicated answer is that it really depends on the spatial scale and the type of model that is being employed and which types of processes you're interested in representing. Um, so the overarching goal would be to be able to model basin scale, and we'll talk more about this in the coming days. Um, so basin scale, hundreds of kilometers, and but your uh, computational costs are going to increase dramatically. Um, so you sort of need to decide which processes you're, you are interested in representing. Um, if you want to do for full plural elasticity with finite elements, you're probably not going to be able to represent that area. Um, but maybe you can understand the, uh, the fluid diffusion. Of course, then properties like permeability, um, control how fast fluids are migrating. So um, then you and your temporal scales are uh, fluctuate as well. So I think in general, like right now where we stand, uh, full high fidelity finite element models are on the sort of site specific scale, maybe tens of kilometers, not hundreds of kilometers. Um, but this is something that we hope to address in the future. Um, Josh, do you want to add something about scale? Uh, yeah, so I think there's two elements here. There's how well can we characterize the rock? Um, and so that really, you know, that really depends on scale. Um, the easiest way to do it is with well logs. And so in a place that's got a high density of wells like Oklahoma, you know, we actually have pretty good constraint on rock properties, at least at the well points and pretty good constraints on permeabilities. Um, at a reservoir, at a smaller scale, we'll then shoot 3D seismic. And that's another way that we can get some good constraints on rock properties. Fault properties are uh, really difficult to get constraints on. You know, I, I think we rarely have any good idea of what the fault properties are. So then in terms of, uh, and so I'd say the fundamental difficulty is just the uncertainty in the properties. In terms of then modeling, um, at uh, reservoir scale, we, uh, we have usually very, very detailed physics because it matters. You know, the, the nature of the fluids that are present will change the pressure near the well. We need, you know, the, the nature of the permeability near the well will have a real high control on what you measure. When you're doing like a basin scale model, we do do basin scale models, but we will simplify the physics because we just care about the large scale interactions so the grid can be pretty coarse, the properties can be pretty coarse, and the physics itself, we may ignore some of the complexities of the fluid flow and use simpler flow models because we're interested in, in large scale things, so. Thanks. So we have a number of questions which uh, center around some of the simplifications um, in um, RSQ sim sort of across the, the, the time scale. Uh, we, we had one question that, and it sort of deals with all aspects. One is on the on the short time scales, you showed the match between fully dynamic rupture and and the quasi static approach. And there was a question if the uh, this quasi dynamic approximation is similar to radiation damping, um, and, and I think it is. And 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 I wonder um, if you could comment on the degree. Uh, to this of the similarities and the conditions under which those similarities break down. And then we have a number of other questions sort of going to the longer time scales as to the viscous loading, the fault system evolution, and also the, the complexity of the, um, of the rupture propagation in the presence of other faults. So maybe we can address some of these issues step by step. Okay, so uh, first of all, so yeah, so, so this is the radiation damping term. Uh, I prefer sheer impedance, but 
doesn't matter of the term, but it's the same thing. And so it's a pretty primitive representation of uh, what's going on. But uh, I, I'll, and, and I'll point out that uh, this, most of our simulations to date have just used this as a constant value where delta S is the stress drop uh, in an earthquake. Um, the code has been modified so that this is dynamically updated as to what the current stress change is. And when we add that, uh, it changes the simulations somewhat. Um, doesn't change the, the statistics, which is kind of really one of the things we're most, most interested in. Um, but it does, when, when, we, when we make this a, uh, a variable during the rupture based on what the current stress is and what this sliding friction is, uh, we get um, a, the rupture speed is very high initially and decays and looks very much like uh, the um, uh, kind of full dynamic simulations. Also, we're, we use a very coarse mesh and that mesh is not uh, able to resolve uh, the breakdown of stresses at the rupture front. But I have to point out that except for a one or two of, uh, that, that I know of, of very, very large scale simulations, um, the, the breakdown, the process zone, the breakdown zone that we observe in the laboratory, and we have no reason, uh, and, and there are reasons actually to think that that's a pretty good approximation. Um, you need a mesh that is uh, on the scale of one meter spacing. And that's just beyond the reach of most dynamic simulations, certainly for big earthquakes. And so um, there, are sub uh, there are very substantial approximations we make, but I would point out that the fully dynamic simulations also have that same approximation. Now, um, we use analytic solutions of kind of for other approximations that go on here. These are, these are approximate representations of rate state effects. Um, the nucleating slip, uh, those analytic solutions have been checked against kind of the full computational, um, and they look really quite good, I think. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, with rate state friction, the fault is sliding at any stress. And so we've, we assume it's fully locked. Uh, and uh, so the evolution here during the uh, locked phase is, is, is approximate only. Um, and uh, um, I don't know if that, if that addresses the questions or not. Uh, we would certainly like, I mean, if we had a choice, we'd do all this with finite elements. That's just, but it's just out of reach. Uh, and so, so this yeah. is the best we can do now. Thanks. Yeah. No, I think this is this is this is a pretty wide open topic. Maybe maybe we can have one more more comment on the sort of approximations on on the reservoir scale. And, and we had we had a number of questions as to um, what what about the the complexity of of, of the ruptures. What about um, other faults. Uh, what about branching and and sort of you know activation of structures that are not represented as well as geometrical complexity. It was my understanding that you, you had something akin to RSQ sim on a reservoir scale, and we're then exploring the, the dynamics there. And what you found is that the seismicity responded to stress shadow effects and uh, things like that. And I guess some of these mechanical interactions could be captured by static computations, boundary element, you know, sort of classic computations of, uh, fault interactions, and so I wonder um, how much of the dynamics matters in these simulations beyond having a representation of the pressure distribution of the injection side and how faults are oriented and maybe interact in a static sense. How much of, of the dynamics needs to be captured um, to be plugged into the rate state equations? Yeah, uh, okay, so uh, just, just to clarify, we did a, rate, a full uh, RSU sim simulation of tectonic earthquakes uh, for the Valdagri fault system. Uh, and uh, there's clearly more faults than this. 
uh, we think these are the major faults. So there's an approximation there. Uh, our plan is to uh, begin, uh, the next phase will be to use RSQ SIM with uh, the full fluid pressure changes over the entire field. And ENI has a pretty good idea of what those are because they've got wells all over the place and they spend a lot of resources in modeling the, the fluid pressures and fluid, diffu fluid diffusion uh, in the field. Um, we do see, uh, it, getting to the dynamic effects, we do see rupture branching. And uh, Kayla may want to address this. She, she for her thesis, uh, did some work on rupture jumps uh, and comparing um, rupture jumps to, in a, using RSQ SIM, which is kind of a quasi-static or quasi-dynamic, and uh, fully dynamics uh, with um, uh, a finite element code. Uh, basically, they're very similar. We, we don't see much difference, but uh, I don't know, Kay Kayla, maybe you want to say something? Mm, I'm right, I think that the, um... The results we get for rupture jumps and fault interaction from RSQ SIM are quite similar to those effects that you would be able to estimate with a fully dynamic uh, earthquake simulator. So in the sense that um, wave propagation triggers failure on an adjacent fault, we are able to capture most of those effects. So we sort of attribute that to the static stress transfers. Um, the question I think in the chat though is more to do with um, adding fracture networks to a fault system like this and what the impact of the fracture network might be. Um, I, you know, for full disclosure, we haven't tried that yet. Um, it's one of the things that we're interested in looking at. Um, I can imagine that you'll see slip, um, similar to how Jim's figure shows here, you have slip on some of the interacting faults or the, the neighboring faults and um, not, no slip on others. And this is due to what the stress changes are um, that, with respect to space, and this will be similar for the fracture network um, as to the importance of the fractures. I don't think we really have a key understanding just yet of how much the fractures contribute. Um, one other thing that I'll show some examples of, um, I think it's on, on Thursday, is incorporating complex fault networks like this between um, in step over regions of larger uh, strike slip faults, for example, in California. Some studies that we did um, several years ago now show that um, rupture jumps between large strike slip faults are, the, there's a higher probability of rupture jumps when you include the complex fault structures in the step over region compared to um, a simpler model without the complex fault structure. So if we can relate that back to fractures, um, we might say that there is uh, the, the fractures may play a role on transferring slip and stresses as well. Very interesting. Okay, so I, don't, I guess we have to wrap it up, or is it one last question? Or one, one last question from from you, Thomas, or maybe you just a uh, kind of broad scale question. So, based on your simulations, uh, if you would run this in a forward sense, you know, could you predict which type of uh, operation is most problematic for seismic hazard? Is it hydraulic fracturing, waste disposal? You showed this correlation between pressure rate changes and seismicity. So, what's most hazardous? Keep in mind, you're recorded. <laughs> well. Um... <laughs> The answer is yes, and that's why we're getting financial support from the uh, ENI, the oil company, is that they are uh, uh, interested in um, kind of using this and other approaches to be able to predict uh, and what is safe and what, what is not safe for, uh, from their point of view, either uh, financial or uh, human hazard. And um, I'm pretty optimistic that we're moving in the right direction uh, to, to kind of take up those questions that you, uh, that, that you raise. So. Okay, um, let's, let's end it on, on that positive outlook. And, and I would like to thank all of our speakers um, for great presentations, all of our panelists and attendees for their participation. We realize that there are a number of excellent questions in the Q&A.
some of those are the issue of course graining and going across scales. And so I hope we will be able to revisit them tomorrow and on Thursday. And so for now, I'd, I'd like to say goodbye and thanks again. And I hope to see many of you tomorrow. So thanks again for a great presentation and great meeting.